chills. Number one. Between the ages of two and five, my family lived in a house that a family friend was renting out. It was a nice house, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a big kitchen. The whole package deal for only $250 a month and that included the utilities. We were told when we moved in that there were only two floors, the ground floor and the upstairs floor where the bedrooms were. I remember when we first moved in and I was exploring the backyard, I had seen a window down at the very bottom of the house. For some reason, it had unnerved me so badly, I immediately burst into tears. Since my parents couldn't get me to explain what had spooked me, they simply took me inside to calm down. The window was a source of fear and unease for me until we moved out when I was five. My parents assumed that I would grow out of it, and I did, but not until we moved out. I could never place why it creeped me out so badly, but I avoided that part of the yard like a plague. My most vivid memory of my childhood happened in this house. I had been asleep in bed one night when a strange thump from downstairs woke me up. I've always been a light sleeper, but I fell back asleep too quickly for the thud to really make any difference. I woke up again to a heavy, awkward breathing in my ear and someone kneeling next to my bed. When I opened my eyes, I saw the pale, thin face of a man peering back at me. I screamed, he booked it, and my parents brushed it off as a nightmare, but let me sleep in their room for the rest of the night. A week later, my 13-year-old sister woke everyone in the house by screaming at the top of her lungs. She claimed that she woke up to a man matching the one I had seen crawling into her bed. She described his breathing exactly as I remembered it, causing me to burst into tears. My parents were not pleased. My sister and I slept in their room. Food disappeared really quickly. Mom always just said it was having two growing children and my dad in the house. Sometimes things would be moved from where we left them the night before, but that was also brushed off. My sister assumed the house was haunted. My parents assumed she was just being paranoid. For the next couple of years, this continued on. Food disappeared, things were moved, and we occasionally had nightmares about the same strange man. When we tried to convince our parents that we weren't just dreaming, they brushed us off and insisted we were. This obviously caused a lot of tension between my sister and my parents. The night of my sister's 16th birthday came, the encounter that brought about the end of our stay there. My sister woke us again screaming at the top of her lungs, but it cut off too quickly to be normal. My parents, concerned, went to check on my sister and found a strange man in dirty clothing pinning her down and covering her mouth with his hand. A fight broke out between the man and my dad, but the man was nearly 72 and weak from starvation. It didn't last long and soon enough the man was subdued and the cops were called. My mom kept my sister and I in the living room while the cops checked the rest of the house for more people and signs of the man breaking in. Instead, they found a door leading into an unfinished basement. When closed, it blended in with the wall enough that unless you knew it was there, you would never see it. We had never even noticed it, and apparently the family friend who owned the house hadn't even known about it. The one little room was full of pictures of my sister and I in the yard, taken from that basement window. The reason I had always been so frightened of that window came to light. The man had been taking photos of my sister and I for years. That first day, I must have seen a flash of some kind, or maybe the man himself. The man was mentally unstable and claimed that he was in love with my sister and that I was their perfect daughter. He also claimed that since my sister was now 16 that she was old enough to give him another child. I'm not certain what happened, but I do think that he was sent to an asylum instead of prison. Out of the many messed up things to happen to me over my life, this one still takes the cake. I hope you enjoyed the first story. If you're feeling generous, please leave a like as it really helps out. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, then subscribe because I upload new scary story videos each week. Let's get back to the stories. Number 2. I am alone. I'm sat in a hotel room in a town I don't recognize. I'm done running. You can't outrun a shadow. Never be alone. I wish I'd read those words earlier. It's too late now, they've latched on to me. The whispers are getting louder. All I have left is my story and my grandfather's final warning. I discovered his body first. I can still remember the putrid smell emanating from behind the basement door. The terror slowly trickling into my veins as I descended into the darkness. My parents were still tirelessly searching upstairs, but I didn't have the heart to call out to them. I knew what was down there. When the light flickered on, my blood turned to ice. At first, I could only see his feet, hovering motionlessly above a toppled chair. 
As I traced my eyes upwards, I saw everything at once. Mangled skin trapped in a scraggly noose, a murky shadow cast by the dangling light, the pale look of revulsion still etched onto his face. I wanted to scream, to run, to do anything other than stay, but I couldn't. Time froze me on the spot and I watched in horror. It was our fault. No one said it, but it's what they were all thinking. Hidden behind the meaningless platitudes we received from what distant friends my grandfather had left was air of anger and disappointment. You see, my grandfather was not a good man. He wasn't callous or cruel, but bitter and difficult to handle. He hadn't always been like that, but after the death of his wife long before I was born, he deteriorated quickly into the man I knew. My mom claims that he blamed himself for his wife's death. She deteriorated into depression after accidentally running over a young boy in the road. Her heart attack could never be explained by doctors. Her life simply ended, and it drove my grandfather to become the person I knew. By the time I began to form cognate memories of him, he was already at his worst. Combative, impatient, even deceitful on occasion. He was not a pleasant person to be around. I was a challenging child and he never fully learned how to cope with me. My earliest memories of him mostly involved his seemingly endless triads that followed whenever I upset him, which was a lot. He remained the same as I grew older, and eventually I reached the age where my mother felt no longer obligated to force me to see him anymore. She gave me the choice and I chose to ignore him. It sounds harsh, even cruel, but he never made the effort to reach out to me. In the last six years, I've only spoken to him once. It was in April this year, a quiet, remarkable morning as far as I remember it. The phone call only lasted a minute. I wasn't willing to give him the time to explain why he treated me like dirt when I was younger. I don't remember it word for word, but he sounded apologetic and as if he were crying behind the outward coldness he always displayed. He pleaded with me to visit him, but something about it just felt off, as if he was begging, and not in the sense that he was desperate to reconcile our differences. I remember telling him that he would have to make amends with my parents before I could even consider seeing him and then hanging up abruptly. I never received another call. He never rang my parents either, perhaps simply out of fear for their response or he just assumed they wouldn't listen. It wasn't until late July that we discovered his body. We received a phone call from a neighbor of his that we had remained friends with, warning us that he had not been exiting the house in over three weeks, and that his usually well-kept garden had become unusually unkempt. My mom reluctantly decided to visit him, just to ensure he was alive. She hasn't been the same since, none of us have. A shadow has loomed over our family for the last six months. My dad resurrected his old drinking habits, and my mom has sunk into depression. At first I thought it was just the grief and guilt overwhelming them, but now I think it's something more. It happened to me as well. It started with the needless arguments I would have with my boyfriend that eventually drove us to break up. I was so upset that I isolated myself from my friends, finding no comfort in any form of social contact. It took a month of this solitude for me to realize that something was off. I'd always been a sprightly person, feeling an endless and unfillable need to be productive in every second I spent awake. Recently, I felt that even leaving my apartment is too much to handle. I've lost my job, my friends, I haven't spoken to my parents in weeks, but I've gotten a feeling that they're in the exact same position I am. It's like there's something weighing me down, something keeping me alone. Curiosity got the better of me. I needed to know why my grandfather killed himself. I thought that maybe if I discovered the reason I might be able to move on. So I returned to the house. Despite his seeming lack of interest in my life, he left it to me in his will. I began searching everywhere. The police had already looked around, but it's unlikely that they looked extensively. Given the nature of his death, given the nature of his death, they didn't have much doubt it was a suicide. I found the letter in the room I used to stay in as a child. I don't have much time now, the whispers are starting to make sense. I'll transcribe the letter as quickly as I can. Dearest Anna, though it pains me that my last words to you must be written, I no longer have the time to convince you to speak with me. I have alienated everyone I know, and in doing so a shadow has grown upon my heart. I am being followed. Every moment of my life is now consumed with fear. 
They are everywhere, Anna, and they do not stop. It's the curse of our family. Your grandmother was consumed by it. She even told me and I didn't believe her. I caused her death, and I have lived with my mistake for the last 20 years of my life. Now I must warn you, for I fear you may fall under the same curse. It starts with the whispers. They are too quiet to hear at first, but they soon start to make sense. Then come the shadows. The darkness of my house has grown, even during the day when light shines throughout the windows. The room is still dark. You can't escape them, no matter how far you go. I tried to run, but the shadows followed me. No one else can see them, only me. No one will believe me, nor will they you should they latch on to you. The only thing that stops them is others. Surround yourself with others, Anna. It keeps the shadows at bay. They like loneliness. That's how they got my Andrea. I left her alone too often. For me, it's now just too late. I can only just summon the motivation to write you this letter. The whispers make sense now. The shadows are moving in. I will not let them take me. Not like they took my Andrea. Give my love to my daughter and my son-in-law. I hope they can forgive me. Never be alone, Anna. Never be alone. I don't have much time. The whispers. They're starting to make sense. I don't think I can kill myself. I'm not brave enough. They're getting louder. I can hear them behind me. The room is too dark. Why are they repeating the same word? They're wrong. They're wrong. I didn't let him die. I'm not a murderer. Number 3. Had a weird experience at work today and I'd rather nobody make any type of connections when reading this. A little backstory, I work at a small-ish insurance company. Been there for a few years now. That is one half of a single-story building. We share the other half with a mom-and-pop clothing store. My salary is entirely commission-based, so I'm usually at the office working overtime, sometimes not getting out until 10 or 11 at night. The long hours stink, but I make decent enough money so I don't mind it too much. I say this because last night was another late night. Everyone had already left around 8, leaving just me and my close friend left. My friend and I started working here the same day and instantly hit it off. We kind of stuck together ever since. It makes the nights go by faster. So we try and coordinate our overtime hours so at least we have some company. Around 10.30 we started packing up our things to leave. Maybe head to the bar and get a beer and a bite to eat. On our way out the door we heard a loud buzzing noise almost like a ringing alarm, coming from the building's basement. Three years of working in this building and the two of us have never even heard that sound before. It was a continuous ringing buzz, no pauses or stops. It almost sounded like a mechanical failure warning that you hear in big warehouses or something. Really eerie sound. Since my friend and I were the only two left in the building, we went downstairs just to check it out. We've both been in the basement a few times before, despite anyone hardly using it. It's your typical large, unfinished basement with a bunch of old computers, desks, chairs, and filing cabinets all over the place. The company pretty much uses it as storage, but all the electric slash air conditioner units are down here, so maintenance guys are usually the only people that come down here. When we first heard the buzzing, that's exactly what we thought. The AC unit had broken down or failed. It's been a hot summer and the two of us preferred not to come in on Monday with no AC. Not that we could have fixed it ourselves, but it'd be good to call in the problem early the next day just to be safe. We got down the basement and the buzzing noise was louder than ever. We headed to the back corner where the AC unit was. Seemed to be fine, but we soon realized the buzzing noise was not coming from the unit. We walked around a bit more trying to pinpoint the location of the sound. It was super weird because at times it sounded like it was coming from inside the walls. We kept walking around but just couldn't locate it. Eventually, we made our way down a darker part of the basement where a bunch of old shelves and boxes are stored. It was an area of the basement I've never been to, but it seemed like the sound was originating somewhere behind a mountain of boxes. We kept making our way back into the basement moving a few boxes and shells out of the way to make a path for us until we reached a dead end. At this point, we both had our phones out to use as flashlights since it was so dark in this corner. Like I said earlier, the basement is unfinished and hardly used. 
So none of the hanging bulbs in this corner were working, but we had located the source of the buzzing. Whatever it was coming from, it was in this back hallway. We kept pressing our ears to walls because again, the buzzing sound seemed to be coming from inside of them. My buddy then decided to move out some of the boxes and shelves against the far wall to see if there was anything behind them. After shifting all this stuff out of the way and sliding the metal shelves aside, we shined our phones at the far wall and were dumbstruck at what we saw. The buzzing noise was coming from a dumbwaiter. The door to the dumbwaiter was shut, but there was no denying what it was. Next to the closed metal door was a panel with an up arrow and a down arrow. The lights for the buttons weren't lit or anything, so we assumed it wasn't functioning. It didn't strike us as strange at first, because you know, it's just a dumbwaiter. But then we realized there wasn't a receiving door upstairs. Nowhere in our office upstairs was a storage closet or room that would house it. This thing didn't go upstairs at all. So that's what started to intrigue us. The thing about the elevator was that it had a down arrow. We were in the basement, the bottom floor and already underground. Where the hell did this thing go? Where the hell did this thing go? We were about to go back upstairs when my friend hit the up arrow. The buzzing stopped immediately. There was complete silence. He tried pressing it again but nothing happened. Then he pressed the down arrow. We heard a mechanical whirring a few feet above us and then a quiet rumbling from deep within the walls. It sounded like the elevator was moving downwards. After about 10 seconds the rumbling stopped. We heard a muffled clang deep below our feet which was probably the sound of the elevator reaching its destination. Next, we pried open the safety doors of the elevator. Sure enough, there was nothing but concrete looking up the shaft. Looking down the shaft was a thin cable cord that led straight into darkness. We shut the bay doors and made our way back upstairs from the basement without saying a word to each other. Guys, there is something below my office, and we have no idea how to get there. I won't be back into the office until Monday. Took today off, but my friend and I decided to stick my iPhone into the elevator, start a video, send it down, and see what it records. I'll keep you updated. Number 4. When Aunt Norma asked me to house sit, I was hesitant. She lived in a large old Victorian set out in the woods, the kind of place that gave me the chills just driving by. The thought of being alone inside of it, surrounded by her antiques and hunting trophies, had beads of nervous sweat breaking out across my forehead. When I told dad I was thinking of saying no, that I was uncomfortable, he scoffed at me. Don't be ridiculous, your aunt is relying on you. She hasn't had a vacation in years, you're going. He was a big proponent of the picking yourself up by your bootstraps theory, believing that if you just sucked it up and forged ahead, you'd get through anything. It didn't matter that I had been diagnosed with anxiety and was prone to panic attacks and that going to the house was dangerously close to triggering both. In his professional dad opinion, I was just being a big baby and it was time to grow up. I really don't want to do this, I said pleadingly. What about Marco or Anna? What about them? You should be flattered that Norma asked you. It's a big house, lots of expensive things in it and she trusts you to look after it while she's away, not Marco or Anna. Mom, please. I tried to appeal to her protective maternal instinct, but she frowned. I'm sorry, Cassie, but I think your dad's right. You need to get out of your comfort zone a little. This will be good for you. I could feel the tears of frustration starting to well despite my best effort to keep them in check, and dad sighed, disappointed. You're too old for this behavior, Cassandra. Your aunt's only going to be gone for a few days. Go pack, we're leaving in an hour. The drive over was quiet and tense. I knew dad was annoyed and that just made me feel worse, more broken. I wished so badly that I could be the child he wanted me to be, that I could be normal and he could be proud of me. Instead, I sat in the back seat, hugging my overnight bag and trying desperately to ignore the churning in my gut. Dad kept his eyes fixed, stoningly on the road ahead. Aunt Norma's driveway was a large and winding slope up a small hill. We rounded the curve to the house and I shrank in my seat at the sight of its uneven roof line rising in the distance. It was a three-story monster deep green, scallop shingles, rusty red trim, and large windows, 
dark against the overcast day. Ever since I was a kid and my brother, Marco, had locked me in the tower room at the top of the house. I hated it. The memories of how helpless and trapped I felt had clung to me, making the crowded room seem cramped and filled them with shadows that the too dim lighting never seemed to touch. I'd never been alone in it before, and the thought of having to be now sent tiny needles of fear prickling up my arms. Come on, Cassie, Mum said with her best smile, the kind she reserved for times when she needed to convince the kids everything was okay. Norma left yesterday, so you'll have the whole place to yourself. Can you stay with me? I asked her. Even with my anxiety washing over me in waves, I was ashamed. The look Dad gave made me want to shrivel up and disappear beneath the car seat. It'll be fine, sweetheart. You're gonna have a great time. You know Norma keeps the best food in the house and she has the huge TV with all the channels. She's 18, not 8, Donna. Dad grumbled and he pulled my bag from my arms. You've been here a thousand times. Now knock it off and get out of the car. Hurt and embarrassed, I hung my head and shuffled out after them. Mom hugged me to her side sympathetically, but I knew that her patience was also thinning and part of her belief that Dad was right. I wanted to apologize and tell them I'd get better, that I could just get over it, but I couldn't force any words past the lump in my throat. Their goodbye was brief and barely saw me over the threshold. I stood in the doorway and watched their car disappear back down the drive. I stayed there for a long while after they'd gone, my breath shaky, feeling small and alone in the mouth of a carnivorous beast. I could only bring myself to enter fully and shut the door behind me after the rain started to fall. Aunt Norma was something of an eccentric woman and it was reflected in her home. Instead of family portraits, she had taxidermied creatures displayed prominently along her walls. Some she'd kill herself during her trips, others she'd just seen and liked enough to purchase. Her favorite, a snowy owl fixed in permanent flight over the door to her living room, stared baffledly down at me. I tried to distract myself by setting up camp in front of her large television which stood in stark contrast to the rest of the room. The sleek black flat screen and its DVD-filled entertainment center dwarfed the stiff, overstuffed furniture that looked like they could have been house originals from the early 20th century, an odd combination that spoke of Norma's love for antiques, but also for high definition. It worked for a while. I was able to relax just slightly with the noise of a movie filling up the quiet. I still checked constantly over my shoulder, felt the occasional rush of butterflies if I thought I heard anything unusual, but I employed the breathing techniques my therapist had taught me and stayed rooted on the couch. I like to think dad might even have been proud of me had he seen how hard I was trying, but the day was waning and whatever weak light that was coming through the clouds outside was swallowed by darkness. Aside from the living room, the house had turned pitch black and then my stomach rumbled. I wanted to ignore my hunger and I might have been able to if I had eaten anything else that day. Nerves had kept my appetite firmly suppressed, but the moment they relented even a little, it groaned and gurgled back into life until all I could think about was food. Food and the fact that the kitchen was down a long, narrow hallway now shrouded in shadow. I hovered in the living room's entryway, my finger scratching nervously along my forearm, an anxious habit I hadn't broken yet. Maybe two dozen steps, I said aloud, trying to reassure myself that the journey to the kitchen wasn't a journey at all. It was just a short walk. With my phone gripped tightly in my hands, its screen pointed outwards to illuminate the halls. I managed to take a single step forward. When the floorboard beneath me squeaked in protest, I had to fight back the urge to go running back to the couch. I can do this. I can do this. I shut my eyes, pictured the hallway as brightly lit and charged. I slid into the kitchen and caught myself on the door frame, laughing, proud. I'd done it. With the lights switched on in the kitchen, I allowed myself to feel a sense of triumph. I realized it was silly, but I just didn't care. Dr. Jones always said to celebrate the victories, no matter how small. So I shimmied my way to the fridge for some dinner. Cassie, I froze, and it was like ice had poured down my spine. I argued with myself. One half of my brain tried to convince the other that it was just all in my head, that I hadn't just heard my name. 
Cassie. But there it was again. I was certain that time. Slowly, I had turned my head towards the basement door. I'd been so busy dancing around that I hadn't noticed it slightly ajar. From somewhere down below, in the thick blanket of shadows, a thin, ready voice was whispering my name. Cassandra. I screamed and threw myself at the door, slamming it shut with my whole body and turning the deadbolt into place. No sooner had I managed to get it closed that something thudded against the steps on the other side. I screamed again and tore out of the kitchen, back to the living room, where I immediately called my mom. Deep breaths, my mom said soothingly. I had never been so happy to hear her. Something's in the house with me, mom. Please come get me. I heard my dad in the background. Is that Cassie? Oh no, give me that. There was a shuffling sound and then my dad's voice. What's going on? Something's here. Please let me come home. You need to get a hold of yourself. These outbursts. You're too old for them. It's time to realize it's your overactive imagination and you're fine. He didn't sound angry, just tired. And I couldn't hold back the sob that I had bubbled in my chest. Cassie, I love you, but this is good for you. You'll see. And then he hung up. I curled up on the floor beside the couch. My knees hugged to my chest and I cried. Any sense of accomplishment had vanished, replaced wholly by an aching, hollow aloneness. Except I wasn't alone. I looked back down the hall, into the kitchen, and I shuddered. I didn't want to leave the living room with all of its lights and noise from the TV, but my bladder betrayed me. I waited until I couldn't stand it anymore and then a bit longer still. When the threat of it relieving itself with or without my consent became all too real, I was forced from my nest on the floor. I didn't have the time to hesitate despite the knots in my stomach pulling tighter and tighter. The bathroom was down the hall, halfway between the kitchen and living room, and I waddled as fast as I could to it. All of my senses on high alert. I didn't hear the crying until after I had finished and was in the hall again. It was soft and plaintive and coming from the basement. I held my breath, terrified and shivering in the dark hall torn beneath bolting and being stuck in place. Every so often, between the distant sobs and muffles by the locked door, I'd hear my name. Cassie. It sounded so pained and needy, which only made it more terrifying. When I was finally able to rip myself away, I was only too happy to drown it out by turning the TV up. Sleep didn't come that night. Every sound, every shadow out of the corner of my eye was the thing in the basement coming for me. I was cocooned in blankets on the sofa, my phone clutched in one hand and the fire poker from the hearth beside me, and I was shaking and crying quietly, praying for daylight. The knocking started just after midnight, a series of dull, irregular thuds from the basement. Thud, thud, thud. It echoed throughout the house, and each one sent a new jolt of terrified electricity shooting through me. I buried my head in the blankets and had to fight not to call my parents. Dad would just get angry. Enduring it was torturous and finally, exhausted and too frightened to think coherently, I ran from the living room and up the steps to the closest guest room where I could close and lock myself in. I sat in the giant bed, rigged and tense, ears strained, like a rodent aware it's being stalked, and I listened. I was relieved when I realized I couldn't hear anything from downstairs, but that didn't mean I could relax. The night dragged endlessly on, and it was only once the grey pre-light of dawn started to push back the darkness that I got any sleep. Ravenous hunger woke me only hours later and I had to make the trip to the kitchen. I kept the fire poker with me and did a thorough visual sweep as I entered. My heart beated hard and fast against my ribs and I was ready to turn tall and flee at a moment's notice. The basement door was still shut, still locked, and everything was just as I had left it. I was only in there long enough to make a couple quick sloppy PB&Js and wolf them down with a glass of milk before I went outside. It was a brilliant sunny morning and I needed to get out of the house. If it had felt cramped before, it was claustrophobic now. I breathed deeply, repeating to myself all was well and I was okay, and I walked along the cobblestone path leading around the side of the house. Norma let her large yard run wild, saying she loved the freedom it represented. 
Because of this, the grass grew tall, weeds were as plentiful as flowers, and the trees stretched wide and open in every direction. I would have missed the basement window, set low to the ground and half concealed behind an overgrown bush, except for the sun glinting off of it. I paused and scratched my arms, struggling internally. I wanted to look. I didn't want to look. I did. I didn't. I needed to know. I was scared. But the window allowed me to peek in without actually going into the basement and, eventually, I crouched beside it. The glass was dirty on both sides and I had to wipe away a layer of grime before I could even begin to see inside. It was dark. All I could make out was a mass of shapes. All of Norma's things that didn't fit in the attic. I didn't see anything moving, didn't hear anything, and after a moment, I stood up again. Maybe dad was right, I said doubtfully. I turned away with a shake of my head and behind me, something rattled the window's glass from the inside. It took some convincing and some crying and some screaming, but my parents showed up a half hour later. Dad marched past me straight into the house and I followed on his heels. Please, Dad, don't go down there, I begged. No, it's nothing. You've let your damn imagination get the best of you and I'm going to show you. I grabbed at his wrist, but he shook me off roughly. Mom took my hand and tugged me gently back to her, but I was hyperventilating. The room was spinning, and I pulled away to stagger into the kitchen. Dad, I had to hold the fridge handle to stay on my feet. Please. But he opened the door and went down, never once looking back. Jesus Christ! Mom flew past me at the sound of Dad shouting, and she called down to him, Tony? Jesus Christ, oh God! He was still shouting. There was a loud scraping. It sounded like metal banging and my dad yelling for us. I managed to get across the kitchen and, with small trembling steps, I followed mom into the basement. Dad was hunched over with his back to us, mumbling rapidly. Even mom paused on the final stair, her posture tense. Tony? He turned to us and his face was a white mask of horror. I've never seen my father so shaken and it was almost enough to send me reeling backwards. Donna, help me. What is it? What's wrong? He moved aside and my mom and I gasped. Aunt Norma was face down on the basement floor, pinned beneath a heavy set of steel shelves and everything that had been on them. Old books, sporting equipment, and various odds and ends had spilled around her. Beneath the dark hair that had fallen across her face, her skin was shockingly white. I could have sworn I saw fleece of red around her mouth. Was she breathing? I couldn't tell. I felt sick, awash with dizziness, and I looked away, unable to stomach the sight. With my eyes turned to the floor, I became aware of about a dozen balls, golf and tennis, scattered across the bottom of the stairwell. With a slow sinking, I pushed myself up and walked mechanically to the basement window. Another few balls were lying beneath it. Oh, oh no, I breathed, realization setting in like a sharp blade. Norma had never made it to her vacation. She must have come down to the basement to get something, had tried to pull something down and the whole shelf had come with it. That was why the door had been open. The voice, thin and pained, had been hers, calling to me. It was her that I had heard crying in the night. She must have been throwing the balls that had fallen around her at the stairs and then at the window trying to get my attention. And I ignored it. I'd been so scared, so wrapped up in my own head, that I had not even checked. While well, mom and dad scrambled to get Norma, who had yet to move or speak, out from under the shelf, I sank to the floor, my hands covering my face, and I let the guilt dissolve me into tears. Number 5. This is the scariest story I've ever found myself a part of, and one that I'd like to tell people I meet at bars. Most of them laugh and don't believe me. Others are very intrigued and ask for every minute detail, but I'm telling you now that it's true and my roommates can attest to it. For a brief few years, I went to college in one of the biggest, if not the biggest city in Kentucky. In between the university and the hustle and bustle downtown area was what we called Old Louisville. Old Louisville was composed of a mishmash of beautifully decorated and completely unkempt historic homes with building dates ranging from the late 1800s and on. Many of the owners did a piss poor job of remodeling the mansions, so they were split into apartments of sorts. 
And in one of these mansions, converted apartments, is where my story begins. I lived with two females and one male in a three-bedroom, two-story mansion. I shared a room with the male who, for the sake of anonymity, will call Q. The place was dirty, but you absolutely couldn't beat the price, 200 per person including utilities, and it was about a mile or so walk to campus. The apartment must have been over 2,500 square feet. We all had the biggest apartment in the house. There was a vacant apartment on the third floor above us and an apartment beside us on the first floor. I cannot preface this enough to you that this place was gigantic. When you first walk in through the enormous front door, you're greeted by two giant staircases with old wooden banisters that led to the upstairs bedrooms and kitchen. One of the staircases led to the vacant apartment above us, but it was sealed from the inside. On part of the landing off one staircase, we even had a stained glass window. This made more sense to me when I finally moved in because there is built-in pews on the first floor where our designated living room was. I'm guessing it served as a church at one point, but now that I think about it, makes everything a tad more creepy. I'm probably not describing the layout of this place the best, but it doesn't really matter. The only relevant piece of information about the layout that pertains to this story is the staircase that led to our basement. When we first did a walkthrough with our landlord, we noticed that the staircase not only went up to our bedrooms, but sunk into what we imagined was a basement. At the time, we didn't care to explore it because there wasn't a light that illuminated the dark passageway and the stairs were full of paint cans and other miscellaneous home improvement type doodads. We figured he would move all this stuff when we got the keys, but after living there for a month, he never came for his possessions and we all forgot it even existed until one night we got drunk and played hide and seek. I should make note that Q, one of the girls and I all work the same graveyard shift at the same warehouse in Louisville. If you're from the area, you'll know the warehouse I'm talking about because nearly 80% of its employees are university students. But that's not the point. The point is that we came home late every night, usually around 4 or 5 in the morning. During the week when we worked, our fourth roommate told us she never felt safe alone in that big of a house so she practically lived with her boyfriend. This means that between the hours of 12 and 5, no one was in our apartment during the week, or so I thought. A few weeks into living at the new house, things in our apartment started to vanish. Not normal things though, like socks or clothes or food. Our cleaning supplies would go missing, our bowls, our spoons, and even entire brand new bags of unopened toilet paper rolls would simply disappear. We didn't know what to make of it. We laughed about it at first, but after the third week or so, it turned into more of a nervous laughter, and I would say our friends found us to be a little more paranoid and uneasy when they came to visit us on the weekends. Things just didn't feel right in our home. I can't explain it. The best I can put the feeling into words is that when you're asleep, you have the unconscious feeling, even in your dreams, that someone is walking around in your home, someone that you didn't invite. So one weekend we invite a decent amount of people to our house for a party. By midnight, everyone was properly drunk and I, in my infinite wisdom, decided it would be a fantastic idea to play hide and seek. Everyone happily obliged and one of our buddies volunteered to be the seeker. I rushed around the bedrooms and hallways turning off every light I could find and then repeated the motions on our first floor. I had turned every light off in our home when I turned and realized there was still a light shining in the back staircase the one that led to our basement. By this point I was creeped out so I yelled for Q to grab his gun and come check the staircase with me. In hindsight, having a drunken college kid wield a pistol in a house full of people where ghosts may be likely is an incredibly stupid idea but we didn't care. The liquor courage gave me the balls to act tough and I was going to settle this shit once and for all with Q. I was tired of living afraid of my own house. So we pattered down the dusty staircase making sure to hit every single spider web in our way and noticed the light is indeed coming from the basement but a screen door was blocking us from entering. It looked like our landlord had used a cult gun to seal off the doorway so with only the slightest bit of force we were able to open the shanty screen. At this point I let Q take the lead because you know he had a gun. The rest of our party had gone silent and made a single file line behind the two of us. Q stealthily leads us down maybe 7 or 8 flights of steps and then the basement opens up into a huge space. Off to the left a brightly shining lamp 
absent of his lampshade, sat on a busted end table next to a discolored mattress covered with a handful of disgusting comforters. In complete awe of what we had stumbled upon, Q wasn't paying attention and tripped over a box, spilling its contents. Hundreds of broken and used needles gushed out onto the basement floor. We all looked at each other, stunned. Someone was living down here, underneath us, maybe more than one person. Then we started to notice our cleaning supplies, our dishes, our toilet paper. We spread out around the basement for the next half hour or so, investigating every little thing we could. An old wooden frame TV with bent antennas made its home on a broken TV stand. A photo album with faces of strangers smiling. A photo book of someone's memories lying in absolute filth in the basement of a mansion. Then I found something that made me pack everyone up, leave the house and call the police. Lying underneath the end table was a relatively new and clean looking manila folder. Curious, I opened it and reviewed the fresh sheets of paper inside. They were release papers, from prison. A man's mugshot decorated the top, with the list of charges below, assault, drug trafficking, domestic violence. He was released two months prior. Long story short, the police came, found a door in the basement that led to our back lot which was never used and never locked, and determined that was his point of entrance. We think that while we were out of the house, he came in through the screen door and gathered supplies from our bedrooms and kitchen. I'm at work right now, but I'll post some pictures of the inside of the house when I get home. It is now abandoned. I went back to gather a few bits and pieces of things I had left in my room a week after we told the landlord that we were moving out. But when I arrived to the house when I got off work, I could see a light on in my bedroom and our front door was wide open. I decided to leave my things. Just got back home from work and was able to find a few pictures of the house. This was years ago. This picture of the door was the door that led to the third story vacant apartment. Before you go, I wanted to tell you about the giveaway I'm hosting. But first off, thanks for watching and leave a like so I know you made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to subscribe because I upload new videos every week. My name is Chills and I'm thanking you all for your support by giving away three $100 Amazon.com gift cards. It's completely free to enter and you can enter the giveaway by visiting the link at the very bottom of the description. It doesn't matter when you're watching this video because top15s.net slash giveaway will automatically direct you to my most recent giveaway. See the terms and conditions on the linked page for full details. If you want to follow me on social media, my Twitter is at yt underscore chills, and my Instagram is at Dylan is chillin yt with underscores instead of spaces. Feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions. See ya.